Let's begin with the time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful just to worship your name and just to be able to fellowship any way that we can, God. I pray that you will just have your presence over this service, that we will just be able to uh, worship and just hear your voice, God, that we can just uh, be able to feel your presence and be able to go out into the community and show who you truly are, God. And I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. I just have a few announcements for you guys here. Uh, the first is, of course, um, we ask that you wear a mask upon entering and upon leaving and also during uh, congregational singing. Uh, but other than that, as long as you are at your seat, you may take your uh, mask off uh, for that. Uh, for the youth this week, we have a really big week uh, for youth. Uh, we had our camps canceled on us, and so I decided to plan a week-long event anyway, and that starts tomorrow night for the youth. So each night during the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we will have something from 5.30 to 7.30 for the youth. We're starting off tomorrow night doing tie-dye t-shirts. I bought everybody a bunch of t-shirts. Uh, we're going to tie-dye the t-shirts. My mom's coming in to speak, and so it's going to be a great uh, start to the youth week. And then each night since each night after that, we're doing something else, a different theme, a different night, having a lot of fun. Uh, I will be ordering pizza for the first night, uh, and then each night's going to kind of have different foods and different elements to it. And so it's going to be a great, uh, great week. It's going to be very exciting. So I hope that uh, your student can make it to at least one of the nights. There's no excuse. It's every night this week. You can make it to at least one. So that's going to be a great time. Uh, Mark asked me to remind that there is a finance meeting tomorrow night. I can't remember the time. 6.30 tomorrow night. Uh, so if you're a part of that, make sure that you are there. Uh, those are my announcements. I'm going to hand it over to Kathy. All right. Good morning, everybody. If you will stand. We're going to sing together. The words will be on the wall. We're going to start off with, I've got Jesus. God is in the house. I've got Jesus. Jesus. Calls me for his own. He lifts me, lifts me above the world I know. God is in the house, there is no doubt. God is in the house, you can't keep him out. As for you, as for me, we're gonna serve the Lord. As for me, God came and found me. As for me, he took me home. As for me, he I heard an old, old story 
the great singing this morning. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. And good morning. So excited to see you here this morning. I hope I can, I hope I can focus on what I'm talking about. It, it just, it's just great seeing you. I, I get so much joy of going out to the Sunday school classes that are meeting under trees. God bless you for it improvising and overcoming and and i'm sure that if if it's not one of your sunday school classes that are meeting under the trees i bet you'd be welcome to to come in and visit with them we also have a great class that meets at uh, on tuesday nights as well the stewards class and you're welcome to, to be a part of that and if if you're not comfortable you want to find put another group together to meet uh come and talk to me and we'll we'll make that happen we love the fellowship of the lord and and uh there's just something powerful about being together with God's people. Uh, as we go into this time of, of uh, prayer uh, and meditation, I have a few things to share with you. First of all, we want to uh, express Christian sympathy to Mary Ann Kinder. Her sister died yesterday. Jane Howdy shall lift that family in prayer. Also, Doris Armstrong, we have good news. Um, she is able to go home from, uh, from uh, physical rehab, and uh, we're excited about that. She is determined to be able to walk on her own, pray for her on that. Uh, also, uh, somebody that, that uh, was started coming before the COVID uh, happened and, and uh, was attending regularly, he and his wife, um, uh, his name is John Clatterbaugh, and he has very advanced cancer, and he asks that we lift him up in prayer by name. We want to continue to remember those in our church that are dealing with cancer and its after effects, its treatments. Danny Michaud, Jim Harner got a great report that this week. We praise God for that. Maynard Barker, Dan Anthony. Of course, also remember Jean Strickler. She recuperates in Florida uh, with a daughter. Pray for our... Um, Pray for our nation right now on so many different levels. Depending, it doesn't matter what your political perspective is. We know that you love the United States. We know that you love our country. We know that you're concerned about, about the culture and, and the, the, the concerns of our nation. We are uh, in very challenging and trying times. Lift our nation up in prayer. And also, as I go across the, the congregation this morning, we have people in education, law enforcement, people that own their own businesses. To, to some degree, to great degrees, everybody is affected by this, and, and um, we are dealing with a moving target on the COVID. And so that God give us wisdom uh, that we keep our inner peace within us, which will cause us to act respectfully and respectfully and reflect the character of Jesus Christ. Ask that God gives us the empowerment to do that through his Holy Spirit. We'll have a time of... Um, We'll have a time of meditation, and then I will lead us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, while we live in challenging times, while we see things in our world that seem so uncertain, we know that our certainty is in Jesus Christ. We know that our foundation is the one that spoke creation into existence, that knew us at the foundation and the creation of the universe that knew our time that knows our breathing in and breathing out that knows the hairs on our head father that knows us more intimately than ourselves and loves us more intimately than we can even love ourselves because of that because we claim that jesus christ is lord while things are uncertain around us we fear not. And Father, give us the empowerment through your Holy Spirit, the only place where that empowerment can come from, to walk in confidence, to, to speak with compassion, to think 
with wisdom and to reflect the very character of Jesus Christ. We ask this in great confidence in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I don't know where that unwelcome hum is coming from, but it is not in the same key as the song that George and I are going to do, so it, it better go away. Here it goes. No. Oh, goodness. We never know what's going to happen on a Sunday morning, do we? But I'm glad you all are here. This is my buddy, uh, George Goodlow. Love to hear him play guitar. And uh, this is called Another Day. And um, I just want to tell you all that when you're singing, I know that the masks, I know it's hard to sing with the mask, but you're doing such a great job. And when I look out at you, I see your eyes, and I see you smiling, and they're full of joy. And I know that you're happy to be here, and I'm so happy that you're here. Um, and it's just wonderful to share another day with you. All right, George. Thank you so much, George and Kathy. That was fantastic. Praise God. And I'm, I, I, I've got to focus myself. I'm just so excited to see you here in the worship. It's, it's just great being in the house of the Lord. And more and more of you sh are showing up every week, and we appreciate that so much. Uh, I, I know we, we still may be having a few de technical difficulties, but first of all, I want to praise God for the technical difficulties that we have overcome. First of all, this morning, you have air conditioning. Praise God, yes. Because <laughs> it's going to get awful hot this week. 
And and also, I believe the FM thing is working out in the parking lot and a few other things. And also, my, I have a computer, so I was able to retrieve my sermon. I'm praising God for that. So it's good to be with you here this morning. We are going to get through the Ten Commandments. I'm on commandment number eight, and it's Exodus t- uh, 20, 15. I'm not going to even ask you to look it up because it simply says, do not steal. Do not steal. So uh, repeat that with me. Do not steal. See, you've already memorized Scripture. Look how easy that is. And you're probably thinking, well, okay, Pastor, three words. That's, it's, it's pretty direct. Why do we have to endure a sermon on something that is so straightforward and direct? Well, just as on the other very simple and direct Ten Commandments, there's a lot more going on that we see on the surface. It it tends to be a lot more complicated than that. There was once a pastor, and something you got to know about this pastor, he was stubborn and he loved to play golf. And late one Saturday evening, the angel of the Lord appeared before him and said, Pastor, prepare yourself for today, tonight. You are going to be in the presence of the Lord. The pastor looked at him and said, Well, angel, do you realize what day this is? It's, it's Saturday night. Tomorrow is Sunday morning. I've got, a, I've, worked, I've got a sermon I've worked very hard on. And come heaven or high water, I'm going to preach that sermon. And then not only that, the chairman of deacons or I are going to the country club. We're going to have a nice buffet together. And then after that, we're going to play golf in the most exclusive course in the county. And the angel of the Lord said, well, it's a lot more complicated than that. And, and, and the pastor said, I, I don't care. You can pick me up at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I'll see you then. And the angel said, well, I'm not omniscient on that. I'll tell you what. Let me go back and check and see how many golf courses, how the golf courses are back in heaven. And, and the pastor said, well, I'll tell you what. If the golf courses are better than this exclusive golf course that I'm going to tomorrow, you, uh, let me preach my sermon tomorrow and you can pick me up at noon. And the angel of the Lord said, I'll get back right back with you. And he, he go, he's gone and comes back in 30 seconds because time means nothing in heaven. And the angel of the Lord said, man, I've got great news for you. There are millions of holes, at the finest fairways, the best greens. You can play golf every day in heaven for the rest of your life and you will never say, play the same holes twice. And the pastor said, Well, that's just great news. Why don't you pick me up tomorrow after church? And the angel of the Lord said, well, it's a little more complicated than that. The pastor said, angel, I'm losing patience with you. I've told you who I am. I told you what I've got to do. I told you what I've got to do for the Lord tomorrow. And I'm getting really tired of you making excuses, getting in the way and saying it's a little more complicated than that. Angel, tell me, why is it a little more complicated than that? And the angel of the Lord smiled and says, because you have a tea time in two minutes. <laughs> well, it's a little more complicated than that. You see, you see, when God gives us commandments, it's more than just the directive. He, he cares about what is going on internally. He, he cares about who you are in Christ. He he cares about the the spiritual nature of us, and he wants to save us, not only from hurting somebody else, but he also wants to save us from a lot of pain, a lot of regret, and a lot of shame. Well, what we do in the material world 
reflects on us spiritually. Now, now other religions may say, well, this is spiritual and, and, and this is the material world. And, and there have even been uh, Christian philosophies and heresies that, that, that look at that approach. But folks, in Christianity and in Judaism, for that matter, the spiritual world and the material world are very much wrapped up. What you do in the material world very much affects your soul and your relationship with God. Also, what is going on with you spiritually very much affects whether or not you're going to transgress in the material or the physical world. That is why, to give you an example, a couple, well, it was supposed to be a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I spoke on adultery, and Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Now, why would Jesus complicate something as simple as what when, when Moses said 13, 1400 years earlier, do not commit adultery? It's because God cares about what's going on with you internally because he knows that even if you don't act externally, still there is a darkness going on in your heart. There is a shame going on internally that God wants to save you from. He wants to, he wants to rescue you from, from distancing yourself, from, from being able to, to hear and understand and, and know the will of God and know God intimately. And so he cares what is going on with you internally, which also affects the external. Folks, it's all wrapped up in together. So when God gives us these things that, that are specifically talking about externally, there's a whole lot more going on behind the scenes. Jesus elaborated a lot more on that in the New Testament, which shone a light on the basic moral principles that we see in the Old Testament. Are you following me here? Yes. Just nod your head. Okay. Well, there's three principles I want to share with you here this morning. Three key principles to inoculate yourself against stealing in all its forms. The first principle, you need to understand that it all belongs to God. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, The heavens, indeed, the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. See, the Christian is supposed to have a greater, more expansive view of time. I, mean, I mentioned to you in that story, 30, 30 seconds is, it could be in an eternity. I mean, there's, you know, there's no really rec regulation or understanding of, of time in, in eternity, but we're very much in that perspective. But for us, we need to, as much as we can, to have a broader understanding of what time is and that it, what we do really does affect things eternally and so understanding that our perspective needs to be that everything belongs to God and that affects how we see property now there's basically two ways to look at how we see God relating to us what one perspective is that yes God is sovereign God has created all things but 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 the outcome really affects is affected more by what human beings do. The other perspective is that really God is providential, that everything that we have is given by God. He, he foreknows these things, and, and the extreme position on that is, is that we're just playing out the string. Now, most of us are someone, somewhere in that sliding, uh, sliding scale. Most of us do not have an extreme view one way or the other. I will tell you, when I was younger, I had more of a view that, that yes, God has things, he has his principles, he has things in place, but, but we have a lot more control of what goes on in the outcome. As I get older, I see God's hand moving a lot more in the actions of human beings and how he affects things, and I see things more providentially providence 
That's, that's not a word that we use a lot, but, but let me just kind of break it down to its root word. Providence comes from the word provide. God provides. And it's very un- important that you understand that God provides. And so when we steal in all of its forms, and I'll get a little bit into that a little bit later, when we steal in any of its forms, we are violating the belief that God is providing for us. We are challenging, in fact, we are defying His providence for us. On the other side of it, if we believe that God provides for us, we also believe that God provides for other people. And so when we steal, we are violating the principle that God has provided for them. And also, let me take that one step further, that we believe that human beings are made in the image of God. When we, when we violate God's providence for them, we are violating their personhood. Now, has anybody ever had anything stolen from them? Now, I, I think everybody raising their hand. And, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but, but I want you to think, has anybody ever broken into your house while you were away and stolen things from you? I, I, I've, I've talked with people that have had that done to them, and they say, man, for the longest time, it's difficult for me to get over the fact that somebody has violated my my space, my home, the the place where I feel the the safest. Uh, there's there's a there's a discomfort there that that takes a long time for me to get over. That is 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 much greater of a casualty than the stuff that they took from us. See, when you steal, and the reason why it feels so personal to us when we're stolen from and we're aware of that is because our personhood, God's providence, has been violated on a deep level. And God would save you from that, and God would certainly want to save you from being the perpetrator of that. Next principle. It's about stewardship. If all things belong to God and are provided by Him, then what is our role regarding regarding possessions? If we are stewards, that means that we are accountable to someone. If all of it belongs to God, and yet we're entrusted, then there is a relationship and a responsibility between us and God that has a, has a deeper understanding. You see, the things that God has allowed Diane and I to have that we consider ourselves to be stewards of, there is is a responsibility that we have to use that appropriately and properly. To not use it in a way that violates God's trust. To to use it in a way that that glorifies God. Yes, most of it we, we consume, we enjoy. A lot of it is stored in our basement. I mean, we're here in the United States, most of us have, a, have, a, have the problem of having too much stuff and not knowing what to do with it than, than being short of things. But we need to, to, to be aware of the, the needs of others because we are God's representatives here on this earth. When we carry the name of, of Christian, that is a reflection of God in our lives to an outside world, to both believers and unbelievers. And so, when we violate the principle of stewardship, and even worse, when we, when we steal, okay, in its various forms, once again, I'll get to that a little bit later, that is a reflection on God himself, because you are his steward. It, it's kind of like an employee, an employee that works for the company that you work for, or that maybe even the company that you own some of it, and, and let's say that he or she steals for the bottom line of the company. They do something 
dishonest for the for the agency or the government that they that they work for or or the or the company they work for or the hospital they work for or whatever the school district they work for if if you're a supervisor and you catch them in that it is your responsibility to to discipline them in fact quite often fire them but but wait a minute i i did it for the good of the the company or the or the school district or 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 what have you it doesn't matter because if if you violated that principle of stewardship the area that you're responsible for and you do something dishonest or steal then it is a reflection of the one that you work for do, do you understand that and so we are responsible in that. And not only that, there's a perspective of stewardship when we withhold what God has told us to give toward his work in violation of that. Need proof? Let me share with you from Malachi, the third chapter, verses 8 through 12. Boy, he tells it direct. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. You ask, how do we rob you? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contribution. You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that we may be, there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vines in your field will not fail to produce fruit, fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be deli a delightful land, says the Lord. A test of steward is to have the discipline and faith to give up what God has called you, in this case the tithe, what God has told you to give. And, and when you do that, once again, it's not just about the money. It's about what God does transformationally in your life. In Christianity, as I said earlier, the material is extremely spiritual. I had to learn that this lesson uh, <laughs> once again and about 17 or 18 years ago, and I think I've shared with this with you, but uh, it was two or three years ago, and you've forgotten about it already. Uh, I was, when we were in Texas, uh, for a while I was in charge of paying the bills, Diane does it now, but I was doing it back in those days, and, and I was doing things online, and paying our bills online, and all these other things, and, and it came to the point where I was to write the tithe check to Lakeland Baptist Church, and I looked at that, and I just paid two different car payments, and I looked at the total of the car payments, those two car payments, Pretty nice cars. Two car payments. And I looked at the tithe check. And I go, well, I'll be. That tithe check is more than my two car payments. And frankly, it's approaching the payment on, on my house, the monthly payment on my house. And I've got to tell you, even though I'm a minister, I, I got to be a little bitter for about five minutes. And then the Holy Spirit confronted me. And my perspective changed from, well, there's a lot I could do with that 10%. I've got two teenagers. I've got one in senior high that is very expensive. It's a girl. You know how expensive they are. And, and I've got one in middle school, and I've got college looking up for them and, and, and all these other things. And, and that's what I'm thinking. I, then it, the Holy Spirit said, listen, Mark, I've provided enough for you to where you're making two car payments on two nice cars and it's still not 10% of your income? I've provided for you well enough financially that 10% is just about approaching your house payment? I've provided for you that, that you're in a, a good neighborhood in Texas and you lock your doors, but really you could un keep them unlocked during the day. It's, it's that safe of a neighborhood. Uh, I've provided for you a, a, a church that is active in, in supporting mission and sharing the gospel and is blessing your family and, and by the way, giving you, an, uh, giving you employment and, and all these other things to where I realized 
that that tithe was a blessing to share instead of a burden. And that, I tell you, that happened about 17 or 18 years ago. And I was tithing before that, but I looked at it legalistically. Since that time, I've looked at it as an opportunity. You see, being invested in the understanding of God's stewardship in our lives changes our perspective and actually brings joy within obligations. The next I want to share with you, it's about integrity. Integrity has been defined as who you are when no one is looking. But really, it's, it's simply who you are, whether people are looking or, or not. If you have a problem with integrity, it doesn't matter if people are looking or, or not. Eventually, it's going to come out in how you speak, how you act, what you do, what you think you can get away with, and what you don't do, if, even if you think you can get away with it. And so, folks, that, that's just part of the Ten Commandments, and particularly here in, when we're talking about stealing, because I'm about to share with you, there's all kinds of ways to steal. It's not just breaking into somebody's house and taking it from them or lifting something from it. Folks, there's a lot of different perspectives. Let me, let me share with you some of the ways that, that you can steal. That In some of these, we kind of look at it and go, oh, everybody else is doing that, or nobody really knows, or I kind of deserve it, or I can justify that. Here's a few things. Receiving stolen property at a discount, or finding something but not looking for the owner, or justifying that somehow you deserve what is stolen lying about your taxes mm -hmm. uh, usurious interest rates misrepresenting a product or a service um, you justify it by saying well I've fallen on hard times or it really doesn't hurt anyone or borrowing without asking or as I mentioned earlier saying well everyone else does it or it's just business or I somehow deserve that. And while these things may or may not hurt someone, let me tell you who gets hurt in stealing. It's you. It's, it's your integrity. Whether anybody is hurt by it or not, whether anybody knows about it or not, you and the Lord know about it. And let me tell you something about people that lack integrity. As, I, as, as I've gotten to know some of them better through the years and that type of thing, is they don't even trust themselves. They don't see themselves as the man or woman that they want to be or aspire to be. They, they may have it justified. They may, they may put on a good front, but when it comes to who they are in the mirror or who they are with their closer friends, man, they don't even respect themselves. And I can tell you from personal experience that stealing something is something that stays with you long after you've had the utility of what you've stolen, long after you've used the, 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 the value of that, and it's something that stays with you until you make it right. I don't think I've shared this story with you before. In 1974, I was 14 years old, and I was at uh, the Rexall Drugstore in Belton, Texas. And I, I went in there, and there was this, this, this glossy, full-color magazine of a certain rock star that I was really into at that time when I was in eighth grade. And it was two dollars and ninety-five cents. Well, folks, back in those days, I think minimum wage was three and a quarter. I mean, that that would be like something being about three dollars. I mean, twelve ninety-five instead of two ninety-five. And I sure, certainly didn't have the money. And if I did, that was too much money. And I wanted that magazine, and so, whoop, just walked right out with it. Well, I took it home, looked it over a few times, read it. By 1975, I threw it away because I didn't care about that rock star anymore. But the memory of that always stayed with me. I, I'd never bragged about it because I can tell you I was ashamed of it. I was ashamed that even my closest friends, even my, 
even some of my lowest friends, I didn't want to know, want, want them to know that I had stolen something, even something for $2.95. Well, the next year, I moved to New York. The next year, a few years later, I moved to Oklahoma, went to college. After that, I moved to California uh, with a short stint in Texas. After that, I moved to North Carolina, then Arkansas, then South Carolina, then Oklahoma, and then I moved, moved, we moved back to North Texas, which was about three hours north of Belton, Texas. And then in 2007, we moved to a suburb north of Austin, which put me less than an hour away from Belton, Texas. The memory of that stayed with me all those years 33 years later. And so on my day off, I drove to Belton, Texas, went to downtown Belton, found that Rexall drugstore. Let me tell you, that Rexall drugstore had fallen on some hard times. It, it, it looked like the shelves were about half empty and they weren't going to stay in business for very long. There was only one person working in a, a very large drugstore, and he was in the, the pharmacy in the back. And I went up to him. I know this is a small thing, but it, boy, it weighed heavy on me. And I explained to him, I said, sir, 33 years ago, I stole a magazine from you, from this store. And um, it's burdened me. I'm, I'm very sorry. Gave him a $20 bill. And he, he was shocked. You can imagine being shocked for something like that. And he said, well, uh, two and a half, uh, well, let me give you some change. And I said, no. For one thing, there's, there's inflation, but there's also, there's also something to be said for recompense, compensation and uh, maybe a fine for it. I said, I, I really need you to keep that $20 bill. And I'll tell you what, I walked out of there with a 33-year burden taken off of my shoulder. $2.95 magazine. Folks, that's nothing. But it was a dark stain against my personal integrity for all those years. Do not steal. 1974, I, I attended First Baptist Church of Salado. I knew the Ten Commandments. I knew not to steal. I violated that. And while it, it probably didn't, it didn't put a ding in the bottom line of Rexall Drugstore, I'm sure they've been ripped off for a whole lot more than $2.95. I victimized myself more than anyone else. Do not steal. There is so much that God wants to protect you from, wants you to have joy in, and wants to bless you in to protect you from these things. Allow God, trust God in what he makes so clear to bless your soul. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that you, that you love us, that you're our Lord and our God. Father, you, you, you do things, you speak to us, you, you command things, you place things in our life to bless us, not to do us harm. And yes, it's about other people, but it's also about us and our relationship with you. Father, thank you for protecting us from ourselves. Show us how to reconcile and continue to follow in your steps. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Because of the COVID, we, of course, we do not have the invitation time, but we are going to have a hymn of decision that we encourage you to participate in. Uh, after the service, if there's something that you would like to talk to me about, a decision that God has placed upon your life, uh, you need counseling, I will be in the foyer ready to speak with you. Kathy, would you lead us, please? Sure. Will you stand and sing? There's something about that name. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to hear your word and your truth, God. I pray that it just impacts our hearts and just grows us to be more like you, God. I pray that you just continue to pour into us so that we can be pouring out into the community, God. Uh, I pray that you just help us to have a good week and that we can just be able to glorify you in all that we do. In your son's name, amen.